Hello everyone and welcome back to Milserp HQ. This is your co-host Kelly. Thank you for joining me in the Milserp HQ workshop. And today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're actually going to be testing something we discussed a little bit on the previous podcast. And we're going to be doing a little bit of Milserp Mythbusters for you. I guess that's what I'll call it. So today we're going to be testing, as you can probably determine from what you see in front of you, is does it matter how you load a 303 stripper clip or charger? So I'm sure you, if you have one, you've looked up how, how to use a stripper clip or charger and you've seen things like uh, this old, this old graphic or these old military instruction manuals that show you have to load a very specific way. And what that way is, is I've kind of exaggerated it here for you. You have the second and fourth rounds are going to be forward of the first, third, and fifth round. And so that kind of, that, this clip is loaded that way. So you can kind of see, if you look at the back of it here, the second round and the fourth round are in front of the first, third, and fifth round. You can see that on the side profile, the second and fourth rounds are in front of the other ones, or a little bit more forward. And that's the proper way to load one of these clips properly. And I've always kind of wondered why, or does it matter, or what, what does it do inside the gun, or does it actually like change anything? So we're going to be testing that compared to what I'm going to call the incorrect way, which is something like this. And this is a same clip, but just loaded in differently. And the way this one is loaded, as you can kind of see, is each one of these rounds, the rim is in front of the one below it. And so that's how you'd load something like a Mosin Nagant stripper clip because you don't want those rims to be catching on each other. And we're going to be testing this way as well just to see if it makes any difference whatsoever. And we're also going to be testing uh, one of the reasons I heard they did this way is because you can have it this way and it'll work fine. But say if you're in the heat of battle or something and you get it like this, you get it upside down where each rim is behind the one below it. This can cause issues apparently. So I'm also going to try it this way. And we're going to be testing that in, as you can see, two different rifles. We have our 1917 SMLE number one Mark III Star. Love this rifle. Great rifle. It is all matching. The magazine does match the receiver. I know it's in good working condition. I've shot it before plenty of times. I love how it shoots. Love taking this thing to the range. So I know, I know it works right. So it'll be a good determination of whether the clip has any effect. And we'll also be testing our pattern 1914 rifle. Also in 303 British, using the same stripper clip, but a different magazine system. So that uses kind of a Mauser style box magazine in comparison to the infield 10 round magazine or Lee 10 round magazine. And that one is also matching, even though they only number two things, the bolt and receiver do match. So it's as matching as it can be. Both rifles are matching. Both rifles work great. I've shot them before. And you will also hear that you have to use the proper ammo. The ammo can have an effect. So, and why is that? That's because of the bevel on the back of the rim. It's a little hard to see here, but this is 1942 British surplus. So this is like legit stuff. And it has kind of, it has a little bit of curve on the back of the rim here. And what that is for is if it does happen, if the rims do happen to get behind each other, they're kind of sitting like this in the magazine they can kind of slip over or like go, go around that curve. Whereas some ammo, like you will see on this Federal stuff, it is just kind of flat on the back. It doesn't have much of a curve at all on the back of the rim. And if they get behind each other, they kind of, they kind of get stuck. I'm actually not trying to like exaggerate that. They, they kind of just like smack into each other and that's how you get rim jam, which some people claim it's like a really big deal with the infields. It happens all the time. Some people claim it's a non-issue completely whatsoever. So I'm just going to kind of do my own independent test. I don't have an opinion one way or the other. I mean, I like the rifles. I shoot them. I don't claim they're the greatest thing ever designed. I know rim jam does happen or else we wouldn't be talking about it. I don't know if it's overblown or if it is an actual issue. So we're going to, we're just going to find out. So we will. Take these rifles to the range using some good ammo to test them out. The ammo I'm going to be using is actually, it is, I have commercial and surplus. So I'm going to be using some commercial Remington 147 grain FMJ 
which Remington, I picked it because it actually, it has a nice curve on the back of the rim. So that's a good stand in. I don't have a ton of that old Burgess surplus. so I'm not going to shoot it up. And the other ammo I have, this is also surplus. This is 1983 MEN made by MEN in Germany. This is surplus. It was made for a contract. So it's military accepted ammo. It's also legit. Good stuff. Really nice shooting ammo. I love how this stuff shoots. And it does have a curve or a bevel on the back of the rim. It's not quite as pronounced as the 1942 stuff, but it is more than the commercial federal stuff. So this is kind of a good middle of the road. So I'll be using the Remington first and this after, just to kind of see how see how it works with a different test. And I just don't have a ton of the Remington stuff. I, don't know, I got a few boxes cheap, shot most of it up, but I still have some more of this. And then I'll use, uh, I will have some of the federal out there or some Winchester. They have the same type of rim just to kind of test a worst case scenario if we're doing well. All right, so that will be our test. I'll go ahead and stop blabbing. We can head out to the range, test these two rifles and see whether how you load the clip really matters. All right, first up, we have our 1917 infield number one Mark III. We're gonna be testing it with a properly loaded clip. So up down up down up and this is a nice smooth number two clip Let's see how it feeds a little tight yeah, these are always tight there we go take the clip off any rim jam nope here we go No issues, just as we expected. Now we're gonna test our number one Mark III with an improperly loaded clip, like you would see with a Mosin Nagant or something like that, where each rim is in front of the last one. So this one is on top of this one, on top of that one, on top of that one, and so on. No issues whatsoever. All right, for our third test, same clip, same loading style with one rim on top of the other, we're going to put it in upside down. Now, if anything will rim jam, it should be this. Yep, already given us issues. Come on, there we go. All right. No issues whatsoever. I'm actually surprised I didn't have any issues at all with that. I fully expected to get a rim jam there. All right, next up, we have our pattern 1914 rifle, also World War I era. I believe this one was made 1916 or 1917 by Eddie Stone Remington. This uses a Mauser box style magazine and a Mauser style action, but still feeds from the same stripper clip, firing 303 ammo. So we'll test it. This one loaded the proper way. Already much smoother. Interesting. Must be a Pierce primer on that one. Yep, just a Pierce primer. Nothing to really worry about. Out 
as expected, no issues whatsoever, but also a good lesson, always wear your safety glasses. All right, next up, P14, clip loaded the Mosin way or the incorrect way with one rim on top of the other. Let's see how it does. Uh-oh, what do we have here? That is a rim lock right there. You can see this round rim is over the top of this one. Let's see if I can just bash it to get to go forward because these do have the curved lip on the end. Negative. Give it a little bump. Nope, that one didn't feed. There we go. I had to bring that one, I had to push it down a little bit and get that one to come up off of the rim below it. All right, one issue with that one. Now we'll try the really bad way of doing it. All right, for our last try, we're gonna do improperly stacked and upside down. I fully expect this to mess up, if anything will. I mean, if we already got a jam on the last one, this has gotta mess up. Well, pretty smooth. All right, first round, no issue. stuck but no problem it's getting a little hot no issues feeding though it's getting a little sticky just because it's warming up and there's some, some schmutz in there but it fed all right Since we had zero failures with this guy, we're going to do the worst possible case scenario. We're going to be using commercial soft point ammo that does not have the beveled rim on the back. And we're going to load them on top of each other directly into the magazine. See if we can intentionally induce some rim jam. One. Top of that guy, screw it forward. That's on top of the other one. Screw two forward. There you go. Not sure if you can see that, but you can see this top rim is in is behind the rim below it. Let's see if it feeds. So it gave me a little resistance there, but it was able to push that round below it down a little bit because there's space in the magazine and good and go ahead and chamber so we'll see how the rest of the magazine feeds no issues all good zero issues whatsoever except that first initial little resistance Pretty damn good. I'm very happy with this guy. All right, welcome everyone back to the workbench. So we'll kind of discuss what happened there at the range, and I'm going to share my thoughts as to why I think the SMLE did not have any issues, while the pattern 1914 did have that one issue, even though it was quickly remedied. My first thought is that this gun is actually not even designed for 303 initially. So this was initially designed for a totally different caliber a rimless bottleneck cartridge, the 276 infield, but it had to be quickly converted to 303 because logistics and war were declared. They had to have a rifle in the caliber they already had. They weren't going to switch to a new caliber just to save on time and money and logistics because they needed rifles yesterday and they already had a bunch of 303 ammo for World War I. So this rifle was already at a disadvantage because it was had to be redesigned to accommodate this round. 
And then the Mauser box magazine design isn't really intended for a rimmed round. Like you'll, every Mauser you think of is either is rimless, eight millimeter rimless, seven mil rimless, six five sweet rimless, so on and so forth. So the rounds kind of sit flat in the magazine, and that's not really great for rimmed rounds. You can see the infield magazine and has has an angle to it right here. So the rounds, naturally, they sit kind of pointed up the further down you get in the magazine. And I notice what that does is if you have a round pointed up, you put a round on top, same position, boop, the rim's going to fall in front of the one below it, and you'll avoid any rim jam. And also with the bevel on the back of the case, even if they end up perfectly side by side, they have a tendency to, the, the top round pushing upwards on this bottom round has a tendency to fall forward of the round below it. It's just the way the bevel works, and it's what it's designed to do. Another advantage DS Mini has is a lot more room in the magazine. This holds 10, this holds 5, and we saw to remedy that you had to push down and it kind of popped the rim below it. And with much more room in the SML SML magazine and the way it's designed, you can see here I'm going to intentionally cause a rim jam. Alright, so rim on top is in front of the rim below. Let me get it all the way in there. Alright, now I just push down a couple of times. There we go. Now the rim on top is in front of the one below. That's just that round kind of going down, having a little room, extra room in the magazine, allows the round below it to kind of go down, and the rim will pop over it just naturally because of the angle of the magazine. Whereas with the P14, there's a little less room in there. It still kind of does that. That's what it's designed to do that. You just have a little less room in there. It's a little harder for it to do that. And then also the front of the magazine doesn't go down quite as much. Whereas the SMLE, we have a little bit of room we can nose down. Because naturally, if you have a rim jam, when you're pushing on around, if you have a rim jam and you're pushing, pushing on the back of this one, it's going to... It's going to pivot this one down, and we want to push the nose of this one down a little bit. So it'll kind of pivot that down and boop, pop over it. So it just needs a little bit more, it has a little bit more room in the SMLE magazine as compared to the pattern 1914 magazine. Why it jammed on the clip that was loaded like this with each rim in front of the one below it? Honestly, I don't know. The rims just kind of seem to mostly go wherever they want whenever you load them to either magazine. And my theory, at least, for why they recommended it be loaded with the up, down, up, down, up, is that loading this way works perfectly fine. That's actually probably better to avoid rim jams, but like I said in the previous kind of intro video, if you get this upside down, like in the middle of combat or something, or it's dark and you can't see, if you get one of these, we saw it wasn't a big deal. But if you get two of these and you have all the rims in front of each other, like maximum chance for rim jam, you're going to probably have some issues with that. And so the reason they did this is no matter which direction you put it, it's going to be the same way. So up with the up, down, up, down, up that I showed. Oops, this one actually popped out of alignment. There we go. So like this, doesn't matter if you have it this way or this way. Either way, you have the same loading no matter what. And you can put one in. It doesn't matter if these two, if this rim is behind this one, it's going to pop over. It's just one that's messed up each time. Whereas if you have this and you put it in upside down and you do that twice with all 10 rounds, now you have 10 rounds that you got to fix. Whereas with this one, they tend to fall in correctly, like I was showing with the rims kind of side by side and they pop forward of each other. But if you have this and they don't, then you're going to cause issues. So, here's an example I'll do. I will load it with this right here, and we'll see what each rim does. Alright, so first, first round, take it out. So first round, no rim jam. Take it out. Second round, no rim jam. Take it out. No rim jam. I can see below it, no rim jam. So they naturally, the way they fall left to right, they naturally do not rim jam just the way they go in. Mostly because, like I said, that angle, when you're, when you have one round pushed down like that, 
Keep it all around on top. No rim jam. Just the way the angle of the magazine works and what it's designed to do. So it is a pretty well designed magazine. It is kind of a crutch for the rim round. It probably, I mean, obviously it would have zero rim jam if it didn't have a rim at all, but that's just what they decided to go with. Is it overblown? I'm going to go with yes. Is it, does, is it a non-issue? No. So it does still happen, and I can especially see it if, say, your magazine spring is weak, or like the, I know the feed lips on these magazines are particularly prone to issue. So if that gets bent or any of those get bent, that can cause issues pretty easily. So it's not a strong, robust magazine design at all. When it's in good shape, it has a good spring, it works great. I've had zero rim jams within this rifle ever. And you can see in the video, even when I did it intentionally wrong, the only thing I had was just a little resistance to get that round on top to push the round below it a little bit down so it could pop over, the rim could pop over. This guy is obviously in a little rougher shape compared to this one. I don't know how much use he's got. He's got a lot of training in like home guard use. So this magazine screen, it's a little weaker, I'd say, as compared to that one. And again, it doesn't have the advantage of more space in the magazine and the angled magazine as well. So that's kind of my thoughts as to why the P14 had an issue, whereas the 19 the SMLE did not. And we'll do another quick test. So I'll do this the nose and way. I just kind of want to see where the rims fall in the magazine. Because this is the way that it jammed in the P14. So it should all be one in front of the other. So that one's good. Oop, that one popped right out, but it was good. That one right there is good. And run below it. Good. And now, like I was saying previously, I'm going to load it completely incorrectly with rims in front of each other. It's actually hard to do because I can only push this so far forward before the nose of the bullet is hitting the magazine. So that's also another reason it's encouraging it not to rim jam. So, yep, got to push that one back. All right, it's in. Rim jammed. Do the next one. Rim jammed. And finally, the last one. Oh. Do you hear that? That was one of the rounds below it, unrim jamming. So there, like that. That's rim jammed. Go to bump. Go to bump. Hmm, okay, not unrim jamming, but push it forward a little bit. And these are even the commercial rounds. So that one actually is rim jammed. So this would have rim jammed. But there you go. I pushed it, pushed it down far enough, and then the rim below popped behind the rim above. So now clear. That one, clear. Come on. Clear. And clear. So every one of those I intentionally loaded wrong and they ended up, I just gave it a couple bumps and they all came out correctly. So pretty easy to mitigate. It is annoying if you do, if you do experience it. So I could see that being frustrating to soldiers in the field if they were getting a lot of rim jams or if you're just a casual shooter and all you have is this commercial ammo, more prone to rim jams. I can see that being frustrating. My recommendation would just be to load your clips like the Mosin way and make sure it's the right way up or just give your magazines a couple of bumps and they'll, they'll be fine. So thank you all for joining me here at the Millserp HQ workbench and out of the range. This was a fun episode. I really like testing stuff like this. So. If you have any more ideas, please let me know. Well, actually, one other thought I had was, while I, once I got back from the range, I was like, oh, I should have tested this completely full because then it has less room to move. So that first round might jam more. I probably think it would, just because you can't really push it down that much when this magazine's full. So it might be something I test later. I need to get some more ammo, obviously. But anyway, as I was saying, thank you all for joining me. If you have any questions, please let us know. It is millserphq at gmail.com. Any things you'd like to see tested or any Millserp Mythbuster ideas that you have, shoot us, shoot them our way, and maybe we'll test them out for our next episode. But there will be plenty more to come. we got another podcast coming up, so tune in for that, and have a good one.